This is the Louis T. Network. In the lab room. The views and opinions shared on this program are that of Louis T. and In the Lab Room alone and should be taken exactly as they are given. If you are soft, easily offended, or can't listen to the criticism of your team, this program is not intended for you. This is pure, unadulterated football talk for the hardcore fan. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome, you are in the lab room. I am your host, Lou. Thank you for joining me here on this program, 2014 NFL Lab Reports. Let's take a trip down south, shall we? Let's go to the A and check out the Atlanta Falcons. Ready or not, we're getting it going. Atlanta Falcons Lab Reports. Let's go. So we talk about the strengths of this Atlanta Falcons team, and we know what this Falcons team is really, really good at. It's the passing game, and this Falcons team last season found a way to continue to have success on offense despite a bunch of injuries along their offensive line, at the wide receiver position, and even at the running back position. And so this team struggled to get through the season just to field a team yet they still were able to be highly successful on offense. And a lot of that stems from Matt Ryan just being a really good quarterback in this league. And so you look at their third down percentage, and that's one of the first things that jump off the page at you. They were able to complete 43% of their third downs and convert them. And that's a big number in this league. Again, you know, a lot of teams don't make it above 40. And to get over 40%, and be the fifth best team on third downs offensively. It's a big number. Now, the biggest issue with this Falcons team from, say, two years ago and last year is they were able to convert on third downs last season and the year before that. But the difference was they were able to get in the end zone, cap off drives with touchdowns two years ago versus last year where they had to settle for field goals or they didn't get any points at all because of pressure and getting sacked and knocked out of field goal range. So those are where the differences lie between two years ago when this team was essentially one quarter away from the Super Bowl and last year where they were the worst team or one of the worst teams in the National Football League so or in their division as well. So th this is a huge number, one that they want to continue to build upon in 2014 as they continue to try to climb up that ladder that is the NFC South. You look at another strength for this football team. It's the passing game. I talked about it briefly. And in this team, they get it done. Completion percentage was the fourth best in the National Football League, up over 65% at 66.1. This is a team that can throw the football. Again, Matt Ryan, Matty Ice, one of the best quarterbacks in the National Football League. And so when you have a quarterback that is as good as he is, you're going to be in the mix offensively every single year, especially with this next strength uh, along with Matt Ryan, and that's this wide receiver core. This team is only going to go as far, and again, we talk about the Falcons needing to be better defensively, and they need to be, and we'll talk about that a lot later, but this team is an offensive-led football team. This team is powered by their offense. If they're going to go anywhere, it's going to be because this offense is back to being one of the most explosive offenses in the league, and it starts with Julio Jones and Roddy White. So if those two are healthy, if those two are being themselves, this team is one of the most dangerous in the National Football League. You sprinkle in a little bit of Harry Douglas and all of a sudden you've got a problem on your hands known as the Atlanta Falcons. Those are all strengths for this football team. Not a lot of them. All of them surrounding the passing game. There's a lot of weaknesses to talk about. And so let's just get right to it. It's weaknesses for this Atlanta Falcons football team.
Weaknesses for this Atlanta Falcons football team. My, my, my. Not Johnny Gill. Just my, my, my. How did you get here? Because you got to do a lot wrong to go from 12-4, and 13-3, one quarter, one series away from the Super Bowl to 4-12, and 12, a running mess almost last in your division. Tied for last in your division. Yeah, a lot has to go wrong for you to get to that point. So let's talk about some weaknesses. And there are so many weaknesses that I had to get my crack staff to give me all of the numbers so that I could finish. I couldn't commit all of it to memory. It's too much. It's too much. So I got my crack staff to help me out with these weaknesses for this Atlanta Falcons team. And so I'm going to use the stats that my crack staff was able to dredge up and we start with the running game running in place this Falcons team they struggled running the football for the last two or three seasons now this was a problem back when Michael Turner was in running back when he was no longer the burner he was just Michael Turner and when he stopped running and couldn't find space and, and again you guys ran him into the ground you got yourself a new toy from San Diego a while back and you didn't know how to act you ran the man into the ground and he ran out of gas and so you thought going out and getting Steven Jackson was going to help you he got injured and then you realize offensive line isn't really good so that didn't help either lowest yards per game so you averaged 77 yards per game on the ground worst in the league again you got to be able to be balanced we talked about how good this passing game is how about you have a solid run i'm not asking for this running game to be great how about just having a solid rushing attack to accompany this explosive passing game you had nothing to show for your rushing attack last year it was bad it was 3.9 yards per carry bad again the benchmark in this league four yards per carry if you can't give me four yards per carry, you're not doing something right along that offensive line or you don't have capable backs. And again, it's a double-edged sword here. Your offensive line has to open up holes and your running back has to be able to make the first man miss. If, you're, if your running back can't make the first guy miss, you have a problem at the running back position. And again, 3.9 yards per carry tells the story that the Falcons had a combination of both. Line couldn't open up holes. Backs couldn't make guys miss. 3.9 yards is your end result. That is a terrible number for a rushing offense. And no explosiveness. No runs over 40 yards last year. And you only had six runs over 20 yards. So again, you're not making teams pay by breaking off big runs. You're not helping out the pass offense. You're making things harder on yourself by trying to nickel and dime your way down the field on the ground. You have to be able to get explosive runs. I think you had about one of those in six over 20 yards. Got to be better on the ground if you're the Atlanta Falcons. You go on to the next weakness. QB harassment. I watched Matt Ryan be pummeled last year. And I felt bad for him. I said, man, if I could, I would call quarterback protective services and see if they could come in there and maybe help you out a little bit, provide some shelter for you. Because this is this is bad. I mean, again, I talked about this before in other programs about Lamar Holmes being over there and about how this offensive line was in shambles. And it was from the, the start. Sam Baker was injured to start the season off. So you saw where this was going. And, and when Jeremy Trueblood is a guy that you bring into your football team a, literally a, a week or two before the season starts and he's starting at right tackle, you have a huge problem on your hands and this team had a huge problem on their hands last year and it was called protecting Matt Ryan again he's your prized possession he's the leader of this football team if you can't keep him upright if anything happens to Matt Ryan you're finished so 44 sacks surrender can't happen you cannot allow Matt Ryan to be hit that much speaking of being hit the Falcons were one of six teams in the National Football League to surrender a hundred or more QB hits on their quarterback. And the reason why theirs is more egregious than some of these other teams, because the Texans were higher. You had some other teams that were a lot higher on this list, but the Falcons had one guy taking these hundred hits and it was a hundred on the dot. And the Texans had like three or four different quarterbacks play for them last year. So the hits were spread out. 
So it's okay. The Buffalo Bills, their quarterbacks got beat up, but it was three or four different quarterbacks. So theirs got spread out. Matt Ryan took every single one of these hundred hits last season. Andrew Luck took every single one of those 109 hits that the Colts offensive line surrendered last year. That's a problem. Got to clean it up. Elite level quarterbacks should not be getting hit as much as Matt Ryan was a season ago. You go on to another weakness. Worst third down defense in the National. Football League a season ago. Look, you got to get off the field on third downs. We know the story. We know how this goes. Time of possession is affected by not being able to get off the field on third downs. Points are usually given up. If you continue to let teams pick up third down after third down, at some point you get in the field goal range. At some point you get into the red zone. And then at some point they get into the end zone. If you can't find a way to stop the bleeding, it, it starts to hemorrhage and then things go downhill fast. You got to stop teams on third down and get off the field field get off the field on third downs and it's not just a passing thing it's not just a running thing it's a combination of both if you allow them to pick up four yards on first down on the ground and they run it again it was so nice why not do it twice and they run again on second down pick up another four it's third and two now the options are endless i could play action fake i could hand off the football i ran for four yards on the first two carries why not run again it's only two yards that i need to pick up or I could just spread you out and come out in four or five wide, and I only need two yards for a first down. A speed out will be suffice to pick up an easy first down. So, again, you got to be better on the first and second downs to put yourself in a very conducive environment to get off the field on third down. You did not do that. 46% last year, worst on third downs that cannot happen if you want to get back to relevancy not only in your division but in the nfc conference you look at another weakness passing defense now look i'm gonna cut you some slack you had some young boys out there and at the cornerback position it's usually baptism by fire you just got to throw the young boys out there and let them learn you had Robert Alford last year as a rookie, and you had Desmond Trufant out there playing football. And when you got the young boys out there, you know some things are going to happen. They're going to learn. And that's what they did. So I'm not mad at you for that. Look, I'd much rather you have them learn in a season like last year than have them learn in a season when you're supposed to be really good. And you were supposed to be good, but you had a lot of injuries. I don't think that you had a chance last year. You got blindsided by the football guys and you didn't stand a chance last year so why not let the young boys get work while you're stinking it up it makes a lot of sense to me so 66.1 completion percentage surrender that was good for fifth worst in the league again that speaks kind of to that third down conversion rate and how you struggle to get off the field on third downs you got to be able to stop teams from throwing the football on you we we know the saying, I've been saying it all offseason, I'll continue to say it, a wise man once told me, and I'm just passing on the knowledge. Knowledge is power. Points come through the passing game in this league. Got to be able to stop teams from throwing it, and 66.1% completion percentage is not stopping other teams from throwing the football. That's a really good percentage for teams around the league against you throwing the football. That's got to come down tremendously in 2014. Passer rating up over 102 Look, when you give up a 66.1 completion percentage and you surrender the fourth most touchdowns in the league at 31, the passer rating is going to be extremely high. That's not a good passer rating. That's an outstanding passer rating against you. That means your defense struggled against the pass. And again, you struggled at the safety position. Thomas Deku stunk it up last year. That's why he's no longer an Atlanta Falcon. Your young boys were out there at the cornerback position. And you know, and, and you know how that goes. It's ups, it's downs. You just got to deal with it. You got to let them learn. And that's what you did. You threw them in the fire. You said, all right, man, time for y'all to learn. And, and they were screaming for help. And you said, no, I got to let you do this. I got to let you fly. If you're going to be a bird, I got to let you fly on your own. So they had to, they had to take their beating in like a man last year. And so... You're hoping that everything's better, and I expect them to be better this year after another year of experience. And only 32 sacks. That was second worst in the league. Look, you got to get to the quarterback. And this has been a problem for you. And, you know, I, I gave y'all a, a hard time about allowing John Abraham to walk away like you had it like that last year. I'm not going to beat you up about that anymore because I've already done that enough to the point where it's not even necessary anymore. You know what you did. You traded out uh, uh, John Abraham and swapped him out 
for OCU Mayor. And OCU Mayor, while he wasn't bad, he wasn't John Abraham good. John still got double digit sacks last year. Meanwhile, OC got you six and a half, seven and a half sacks. It, it was a solid campaign, but again, it wasn't John Abraham good. Now, was it? So, and, and again, not to say that John Abraham would have single handedly turned this defense around and had these sack totals up around 40 where it needs to be. He just would have helped you out tremendously. And if teams are paying attention to John Abraham, maybe the other guys get an opportunity to win one on one matchups. Who's to say? But it doesn't matter. 32 sacks last year, that's bad. You need to be better in 2014. So that's your pass defense. Now we move on to another weakness. You see where I'm going with this? You see how many weaknesses there are? You see how many, how, how deep and, and the depth of these weaknesses are? Because you, you delve into it and you're like, man, there's a lot of layers. You're peeling back all kinds of different problems. Rush defense. Mm. So you were bad at pass defense and you were bad at rush defense. You can't be bad at both. Pick one. Can't be both. Second most yards given up total. Over 2,100 yards given up on the ground. Second most yards given up for the entire season by this Falcons defense. So you stunk at the pass, at defending the pass, and you stunk stopping the run. What did you do good on defense last year? Nothing. The answer there is, wasn't a trick question. The answer there is nothing. Nothing. Okay. Second most 40 plus yard runs allowed with six. So, it's, look, I'm a big, I'm a big guy. I'm a big stickler for stopping the run. And I told you, points come through the passing game. I much rather you pass the football on me than bludgeon me to death with the running game. Because to me, that's testing me as a man. You calling me a punk when you just run the football down my face? That's like you, you coming to school after the day before telling me when I come to school tomorrow, you're going to beat me up and take my lunch money. And then the next day I come to school and guess what you do? You beat me up and take my lunch money. <laughs> There's nothing worse than a team telling you, I'm running the football down your throat. Try and stop me. And you saying, all right, I'd like to see you try it. And 10 plays later, you say, God damn, I'm tired. They ran the football down our damn throat. That, that's the worst feeling in the world. And so I'd much rather see a team throw it. Maybe you'll get a holding penalty. Maybe you'll get your hands and deflect a few passes. But when they're just running the football down your throat, there's really not much you can do about it. And it is disheartening. And you got the football rammed down your throat last year. Second most yards per carry. And I think that goes hand in hand with the six runs over 40 yards because that can inflate your yards per carry very easily. But... You can also tell that it was a mixture of big runs and, and little runs as well. Just consistent runs against you because, again, you gave up over 2,100 yards rushing. So it's not like there were a few big runs in there that blew up this yards per carry. No, you, you just gave it up at a very balanced rate. And so that's a lot of weaknesses. You can easily see how this Atlanta Falcons team went from first to worst. In the NFC South, they've got a lot of work to do. And because they have a lot of work to do, let's go on to camp battles for this Atlanta football team. Wow, I'm tired. As you can see, I've got the assistance of my big board behind me. I'm going to break down these camp battles as well as the experiment. So let's jump right into these camp battles for the Atlanta Falcons. And you start with the backup quarterback position. Look, much like most of the teams in the National Football League, especially the ones with elite level quarterbacks, you pray your quarterback doesn't go down. No one wants to see a situation like the Packers went through last year where you play musical chairs with the backup quarterback position because most of the good teams with elite level quarterbacks you don't put a lot of stock into your backup quarterback because you don't have any intentions of having those guys hit the field at all, except for the preseason. And so we saw the Colts do it for years with Peyton Manning. We've seen the Packers do it with Aaron Rodgers and how that worked out for him. We've seen teams do this around the league everywhere. The only team that usually keeps a solid backup is the New England Patriots. Everybody else, they really don't divulge a lot of resources into this position. And for good reason. The Giants haven't had a competent 
backup behind Eli Manning in years. But you can get away with that when guys stay relatively healthy and they're elite. And that's what you have in Atlanta. So you hope that Tyler Jonathan Yates nor Sean Renfrey sees the field at all because if either one of them does, for any extended period of time, this team is going south fast. But nonetheless, it's a quarterback battle. Tyler Jonathan Yates versus Sean Renfrey. TJ Yates is a guy you traded for from the Houston Texans. You want him to come over, win this battle, and I expect him to. But nothing is etched in stone. If Sean Renfrey can come in, play some good football in the preseason, outshine Tyler Jonathan Yates, you might see a guy come in, steal a roster spot from another. We'll see. Really, not a lot of interest for me at that position because, again, I don't expect either one of them to play. You hope that they don't have to. If they don't, you won't miss any one of these guys not making your roster. So you move on to wide receiver. And we know this is the bread and butter of this football team along with Matt Ryan. And so it's a position where you're looking at six receivers here. And Julio Jones, Roddy White, Harry Douglas, Devin Hester, Drew Davis, Courtney Roby, and Bernard Reedy are all in the mix. So you're looking at a situation where it's seven receivers for six positions. Here's how this is going to break down. Double J, Snake Eyes, Double Ace, whatever you want to call him, Julio Jones, not going anywhere. He's on his roster. So is Roddy White. Roddy, Roddy White, not going anywhere. Harry Douglas, no, he's not going anywhere. Devin Hester, you went out and got him for a reason. And you're actually going to use him on offense unlike the Bears did last year. He's not going anywhere either. Drew Davis, here's a kid that I like a lot. You know, he's a big kid. He can run. He blocks well in the running game play special teams. I love Drew Davis, but he's injured. He's dealing with a foot injury. He might start the season on the pup list. If that is in fact the case, someone is going to need to fill his roster spot until he's ready to come back. That's where a guy like Courtney Roby comes into play because Courtney Roby is strictly a special teams demon from the New Orleans Saints. You've seen him in a division. That's why you went out and got him. And he's going to fill that void that's going to be left by Drew Davis. Now, he's not going to help you at receiver at all because Drew Davis could actually play receiver too. But you're not looking and asking for him to do that. There's not a lot of balls to go around anyway. Now with Double Ace coming back, Double J, Julio Jones back in the saddle, Roddy White healthy. He was banged up last year. Harry Douglas proved last year that he can get it done. There's not a lot of footballs to go around. And you're trying to implement Devin Hester into this offense as well. Not a lot of footballs to go around. So... You're not worried about Courtney Roby not catching football. And Bernard Reed, here's a guy that's a wild card. If you decide to keep six and Drew Davis is not ready to come back, I think Bernard Reedy is the guy that's going to take that spot until he's ready to come back. And who's to say that you don't decide to keep seven when he comes back? I don't know if you have the roster flexibility to do that or not, especially when we talk about the linebacker position. But I think if Drew Davis is not ready to come back, I think Bernard Reedy, we saw how he played in that first preseason game. He's looking to get onto this roster, and I think he'll be able to find a way on because of what he brings to the table. He's a small guy, very quick and fast, catches the football, explosive, makes plays after the catch. Wouldn't be surprised if he snuck onto this roster if Drew Davis isn't healthy enough to start this season. You move on to the outside linebacker position, and this, this is a huge position. Along with the defensive line and, and just the linebacking group in general, and we'll talk about linebacker, middle linebacker, inside linebacker very briefly because I don't want to go into that too much because I don't think there's a lot of camp battles per se there. There's just a lot of bodies there. But th there actually is some, some battling going on here. Outside linebacker, five players for four roster spots. Jonathan Massaqua not going anywhere. Corey Bierman, he's not going anywhere either. Good to see him back and see him healthy. Jack Smith. He's a guy that is a young man that you really want to see continue to progress. And Tyler Starr is a man you drafted in the draft late from a very small school. They're starting to document him on Hard Knocks. And, you know, I love Hard Knocks. I'll talk about that a little bit later. But I don't think he's going anywhere. I think he has some potential. I like Tyler Starr a lot. And so I think he's going to be around. Stansley Mponga is the one to watch here. Here's a kid you drafted out of TCU about two years ago. He's going into his third season or so in the National Football League. And now you're, you're basically putting him in a do-or-die situation. Can you perform at the level that we thought you were going to when we invested a pick in you two year, three years ago? Or are we going to be forced to cut ties with you? We don't have any more time to waste. 
We're trying to get better. We're trying to get stronger. We're trying to be more productive on the defensive side of football. If you can't be any of those things, then you have to go. He showed well in that first preseason game against Miami. He's looking to battle. And I think the guy that he's going against to make this roster, if they don't decide to keep five, which I don't think they will, is Jock Smith. If he performs the way that he did in that first preseason game and, and continues to stand out, I think that's the guy that's going to be the odd man out. Jock Smith, I think, is going to be the one that's going to be off this roster. And I, and I think Stansley Maponga is going to be the one to take his place. You move on from there to the cornerback position. I told you how bad this team was last year at stopping the pass. Now, it starts up front with the front seven and, and the inability to get pressure, but it also has to be some kind of accountability here in the cornerback uh, positions and the safety as well. But we're looking at the cornerback position, six for five, six players for five positions. Desmond Trufant, Robert Alford, your two starters. They're, those young boys aren't going anywhere. Robert McClain, I think he's going to be around. Ricardo Allen is another kid that's very young, very promising. I think he's going to be around as well. I think where you have a little battle on your hands is for that final roster spot at the cornerback position. Josh Wilson is a player that you went out and got in free agency from the Washington Redskins. And Javier Arenas is a young man that has been around the block, was first in Kansas City, then was traded to Arizona. Now he's in Atlanta. So he's looking for a home. And he's someone that offers you some returnability in the returns game as a punt returner. But I think because of Devin Hester and some of the other guys you have on his roster, he won't even get a sniff at doing that. So now he has to prove that he can be a really good nickel corner. And if he can't prove to be that because he's a very small guy at about 5'8", 5'9", max. So if he can't prove to be a really good nickel corner, he's not going to make this roster. Right now, I think he's on the outside looking in. If he can have a strong preseason and Josh Wilson falters because Josh Wilson is a guy that I like a lot. Being a Redskins fan, I saw a lot of Josh Wilson. He competes. He's going to be in the play. He, his problem is he doesn't look for the football. Picks up way too many pass interference penalties. If he continues to do that in the preseason, shows his true colors, and Javier Arenas balls out, you could see those two flip-flopping. But right now, I think Josh Wilson is going to make this team as a veteran that can get it done, that has gotten it done in this league. I think he's going to have the upper hand in this battle, and he would have to essentially throw this one away to not make this roster. I think he's going to be the fifth and final corner on this football team. And then you go to, and let me briefly talk about the inside linebacker position. What a shame. What a shame. Because Sean Witherspoon dealt with injuries last year, and his whole team dealt with injuries last year. That's why we saw guys like uh, Bartu uh, at the defensive, or excuse me, at the linebacker position, and we saw all these guys at the linebacker position because you were so banged up last year. And you were hoping to get everybody back healthy and start anew this year. Breath of fresh air. And right out of the gate in camp, Sean Witherspoon goes down for the season. And it's just unfortunate. Now you got Sproul, one of your rookies that you drafted to try to help with this position out of Syracuse, gone for the season. So you're just dealing with injuries at the inside linebacker position. You got Pat Anger to come in and help you. He's dealing with concussion issues. He's always had those problems, even back to his days in Indianapolis. And so you're just hoping you can get someone to come in and help you solidify that inside linebacker position. You've got a slew of guys at that position. That is just a mess. I'm not even really trying to talk about that too much. Let's go on to a position that matters a lot in the grand scheme of things. Your success hinges upon the success of this unit right here. I'm talking about the offensive line. They surrendered 100 hits on the quarterback, 44 sacks last year, opened up no rushing lanes for the running backs. This was a bad group last year. This is a much improved group this year. Now you're just hoping they gel together fast enough to be productive enough for this team to take off and soar to new heights. And it's 10 for 9. Nine of these guys are going to be on this roster. Justin Blaylock, Sam Baker, Joe Hawley, John Asamoah, and Jake Matthews are going to be your five starters. And that's a damn good offensive line, if I may say so myself. If you stay healthy, if these guys gel together, you could have one of the best units up front in the National Football League. The depth behind them 
is the big question and that's why they need to stay healthy because this was part of the problem last year. A lot of these guys started for you last year. Lamar Holmes, we know about his struggles last year. Ryan Schrader, bless his heart, he struggled last year as well. Gabe Karimi, he's a journeyman. An ex-first round pick that just never panned out. He was drafted as a tackle, was quickly moved to guard, and has struggled to find a home in this league. He's looking to try to solidify Ross spot. The only good thing about Gabe Karimi is that he is versatile, can play four out of the five positions along the offensive line, both tackle and guard positions. You don't want to put him at either of your tackle positions, but in case of an emergency, you can break the glass and pull out Gabe Karimi. And I think that versatility is going to keep him on this roster. Peter Kahn's is your backup center. Don't think he's going anywhere. And he can play some guard if need be. But he's your backup center. He's on this roster. And Harlan Gunn. This is the battle for the 10 for 9 that I talked about. There's two guys particularly battling for one roster spot, I think, along this offensive line. It's Lamar Holmes and Harlan Gunn. Lamar Holmes, you need someone to be a competent swing tackle. A guy that can play both left and right tackle so that you don't have to carry as many offensive linemen on your roster. And so you would love it if Lamar Holmes showed you that he's progressing and getting better. And he's been showing that of late. He's been getting better. He's been progressing as camp has worn on. But he needs to be more consistent. That's his biggest problem. There's times when this kid looks fabulous. And there's times where he looks like he hasn't learned how to play the tackle position ever. And so there's some things he's got to work on. And if Harlan Gunn is able to come in and outperform and outshine Lamar Holmes, he'll play his way onto this roster. But right now, he hasn't done enough. And he needs to separate himself from Lamar Holmes. Okay? He can't be playing at the same level as Lamar Holmes because if things are equal, I'm just going to keep the guy that I've been working with this entire time that has experience, that has been getting snaps, and that's Lamar Holmes. So if Harlan Gunn wants to make this roster, he needs to play at a high level. But this offensive line looks damn good, especially your starting five. You just need to stay healthy. You go from those camp battles in Atlanta to, of course, the experiment. And I have titled this experiment, The Birds Be Dirty in the A. Them birds be dirty in the A, baby. Let's get to this experiment and talk about how this Falcons team can get back to prominence in not only their division, but in the NFC conference. And it's a tough one. Research question. After a disappointing 2013 season, did the Get Tough campaign, in addition to an active and healthy offseason, do enough to prove that the last season's struggles were an aberration? To me, that's the biggest question. Yes, we talk about this team needing to be tougher, and I will talk about it in depth as we go on through this experiment. And yes, they were able to get healthy, and that's a big part of why they struggled last year. You know, and it sucks. I just talked about Sean Witherspoon going out for the year, and you wanted to avoid that. I'm a big guy. I'm a big proponent. Just let me get to the starting line with all my horses lined up and ready to take off again throughout the season you're going to incur injuries things are going to happen your depth is going to be tested i understand that that's a part of the game i know the rules to the game so i'm gonna play just let me get to the starting line with all my stuff please they're not able to do that so that's frustrating in itself but to get julio jones back to get roddy white back to get your offensive line back intact sam baker's back to be able to say that i got all of my stuff, for the most part, back, healthy, and ready to rock and roll. You got to feel good about that if you're an Atlanta Falcons fan. And I think all of the moves you made in the offseason to get tougher on both sides of the football, defensive line, offensive line, are going to prove to provide dividends for you early on in 2014. You move on to the hypothesis. If the Falcons can stay relatively healthy, continue to grow their offensive dominance, 
and sprinkle in some toughness along with defensive accountability, then the Falcons can claim what they believe is theirs. The NFC South crown. They were once at the top of this mountain. And so they feel like, yeah, we had a down season and they had a really, really down season. Look, when you're at the top, there's nowhere else to go but down. And when you're at the top, it's a long way down. It's a long fall from grace. And so, yeah, you hit rock bottom last year. 4-12, and 12, it's rock bottom. Especially for a franchise this good. That's rock bottom. You're not going to be 2-12. and 12. You're too good. You're too talented of a football team to do that. If Matt Ryan is healthy, you won't have a season where you only win two or three games. It was a miracle that you only won four. You really could have won six games last year. But again, you were so banged up. You had so many issues. You only won four. But if you are able to get back to the explosive offense that you once were, and I think you need to exceed that. And this defense has some accountability. Are They're able to handle what they're supposed to handle and able to get done what needs to be done on the defensive side of the football because this offense is going to be productive. We know that. The defense has to stand up and get their job done. So that's the question. If those things happen, if they're tougher on the offensive line, on the defensive line, and we've seen flashes of that toughness against the Dolphins in the preseason, again, first preseason game, you don't want to put too much stock into what you see. But you must take it into consideration and yes, that defensive line looked a lot stouter against the run. The Dolphins, by no means, are world beaters running the football themselves. But again, I don't care who it is. They put me on the field. I want to see production. And that's what I saw out of that front line against the run in preseason game number one. So we'll see what they're able to accomplish. That hypothesis is huge. You move on to the materials needed. Get tough. Get tough. And yeah. Everybody's been talking about the toughness aspect of this football team. And if you're an Atlanta Falcons fan, at this point, you're probably a little tired of, of hearing about toughness. You're probably like, all right, man, damn, how many times are you going to talk about us not being tough? Look, if people talk about it a lot, that probably means there's some validity to it. And in this case, there is. You were soft last year. Soft. With a capital T at the end. Soft. Teams smacked you in your face. They ran the football down your throat. Teams got after your quarterback, jacked up your offensive line and hit your quarterback. Teams disrespected you last year. I and mean, you were blown out several times last year. I mean, teams really disrespected you. And teams didn't even used to step to you like that. They didn't even used to come at you like that. They knew better. You were the, you were the big boys on the block two years ago, just two seasons ago. Teams ain't come to you. Carolina didn't step to you like that. You went to Carolina and caught a beatdown last year. Seattle came to your house and smacked you around. Teams didn't dis. You went to Tampa. When did the Tampa Bay Buccaneers ever jump up and smack you like that, man? How home or away? They never disrespected you like that. Teams looked at you and they saw weakness last year. So they got buck. We're going to talk about getting buck in a little bit. But they got buck on you last year. Teams questioned your manhood, your toughness. So they smacked you around. And you did nothing about it. You ran home and you told your mom that you got beat up. And your mom said, hey, go back out there and fight. And you said, mama, I don't want to fight no more, mom. I'm tired. I don't want to fight no more. So you got beat up last year. You got to be tougher. Get tough. And all the moves you made in the offseason. They're going to make you a tougher football team. Tyson Jackson, Paul Solia, they're going to make you a tougher football team. Those boys stop the run. Now, I don't know if you're getting after the quarterback or not, which you need to do. But you're going to get tougher because them boys stop the run. Offensively, John Azamoa, that boy's going to bring toughness to your offensive line. Just getting Sam Baker back. I remember when Falcons fans wanted to run Sam Baker out of town. Be careful what you wish for. You just might get it. You never know what you've got until it's gone. <laughs> and say I'm not playing last year, opened up your eyes. So just getting him back and drafting Matthews, that young prodigy, 
out of Texas A&M makes your offensive line a world different. Makes your offensive line that much tougher. This is going to be a better group on both sides of the football. I guarantee it if you stay healthy. So you got to get tough, man. You got to stand up. And you got to go back to being the bullies that you used to be. Now, you were never a defensive bully. Never a defensive juggernaut. Ever. However, offensively, you were good enough, damn good, to scare the hell out of teams by itself. Just knowing that I got to score 34 points today to keep up with the Falcons was good enough to scare the hell out of teams. Good enough to keep them from stepping to you like they were some OG gangsters. Last year, teams stepped to you like they were some thugs because they knew you were soft. This year, get tough. Ayo! Ayo! It's the next material needed. And I know and what AO stands for is Atlanta offense. Ayo! You know the AO gonna show up. You know it's gonna show up. I don't really need to even talk about this, but I am, because I still don't know what this defense is about. I still don't know if you're going to get pressure on the quarterback. I don't know if you're going to stop teams from getting in the end zone. I don't know any of that. I don't know if them young boys have progressed to the point where they're going to stop teams from throwing the football on them and picking on them. I don't know yet. I don't have the answer to that. So I do know this much. The offense, that Atlanta offense, they got to step up. I need you back to that explosive offense that two seasons ago had you a quarter, a possession, away from going to the Super Bowl. I need you up around 30 points per game. I need you to be scoring 28, 29 points a game. Every week, I need the offense to show up. You can't have any down weeks. You can't have any weeks where you're looking to the defense to bail you out. I need you to be up there with 28. I don't care who you're playing. I don't care if you're playing the Steelers, the Ravens, the Panthers. I don't give a damn who it is. I don't care who you're playing defensively. Jets, don't matter. I don't care who it is. I need you to score points. Now, I know you're not playing the Jets because you played them last year. But I don't care who you're playing. I need you to score points. Hey, yo! I need that Atlanta offense. I need you to stand up and be accountable because this team needs you. Your success depends on AO. Unwounded birds is your next materials needed. You cannot get hurt. You can't. You can't afford it. Your depth was tested last year. And I'm here to tell you, you failed that test miserably last season. And your depth is not much better this year. The only thing I can say, and this is the only silver lining in this cloud that can be completely gray if you're not careful. The only silver lining here is that a lot of the guys that are now depth that had to start last year got experience. They got their feet wet. They know what to expect in the National Football League. So from that perspective, you can say, hey, these boys played before. I should be able to trust them going into the football game. So from that perspective, Maybe you can feel a little bit better about your depth, but I'm here to tell you, you don't want to see some of these guys hit the field. If your offensive line gets banged up, you're in trouble. If Julio Jones or Roddy White goes down, you're in trouble. If anything happens, anything else at the linebacker position, you're in trouble. Defensive line, you could be in trouble. So, I'm here to tell you, stay healthy. And I know you don't control that. All you can do is put your hands together, look to the sky, and pray to the football gods that they have mercy. Have mercy on my football team. Please, football gods. After you ravaged us last year, please have mercy on us. That's what Falcons fans have to be saying. And I think the football gods will oblige. They already took Sean Witherspoon from you. They didn't even give your rookie Sproul a chance. I think they're going to go easy on you the rest of the way. I think. I can't make you any promises, but unwounded birds, that's going to be big for you because, again, you can't get injured. And that, and that goes for any team in the league. But, look, there's a difference between Navarro Bowman going down in San Francisco. You hear the, do you hear the 49ers bitching and complaining? No. They just went out and said, hey, we got guys we trust on our roster, and we'll go out and draft a couple of guys, Chris Boylan and, and the likes of which we got guys on our roster. We'll just throw somebody in. We'll be fine. It always helps when you got a guy like P. Willis, P. Will right next to him that can step in and just be dominant still. But And everybody doesn't have that. But again, they're not complaining because they have depth. But when the Cowboys lose Sean Lee 
or you lose Sean Witherspoon, it's a problem because the depth is now being tested. So unwounded birds, that's going to be huge. Nuck if you buck. Nuck if you buck. Nuck, 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 nuck if you buck. You got to nuck if you buck, man. I, I talked about the toughness aspect already. And I'm just talking to the defense this time. I'm not even talking about the offense. This is totally different from get tough. This is all about this defense stepping up. And you got to start scrapping defensively because I still think you're missing some of the pieces that are necessary. That's prerequisites to becoming a really good defense in this league. I still think you're missing a few pieces. So because of that, I think you got to scrap. You got to knock if you buck. Sullen break. You got to go out and scratch and claw and be ready to fight. And we've been seeing that through the Hard Knocks program that you're a little feisty. You got guys that's out there willing to fight. And that's what you need. They showed a clip. Last year, and this isn't defensive, but they showed a clip of Matt Ryan getting hit late in the first game against the Saints. And nobody did anything about it. You got to stand up for your quarterback. If you're not going to stand up for him. Well, damn it, who are you going to stand up for? And so this defense, I think all of that is predicated around the defense setting the, the tempo and setting the pace of, of how this team is going to be. I think you've got to set the tone if you're the defense. You've got to be a scrappy bunch. You've got to be a, a tough-minded bunch that finds a way to get it done. It, it's not always going to be pretty. Are you going to be holding teams to under 20 points? No, I don't expect this defense to do that. But that's why the offense scoring 28, 29 points per game is going to be huge. All I'm asking you to do is not give up 34 if the offense is scoring 33. That's all I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to be solid. Not great. Not terrible. Solid. I need you to be somewhere in the middle. If you're giving up 22 points a game defensively, that's going to be more than enough for you to win because this offense is going to get it done. Knock if you buck. If you buck, if you think you're tougher, if you think you're better, then you need to knock. Knock up. You got to show them how you do it in the A, 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 A. You got to turn it up. How you do it in the A. You got to show them. Look, I remember when the Georgia Dome used to be rocking. You didn't want to go. Matt Ryan never lost. Never lost in the Georgia Dome. Remember that? Smith and Ryan in the Dome. Don't try it, Holmes. Don't try it. Remember that? You got to get back to that, man. You got to show them how you do it in the A. The offense has to take it to that next level. It's got to be hot. It's got to be dirty in the A. And you got to show teams that you're not coming in our house and getting W's. It's not going down like that. The fact that the NFL thought it was okay to send you to London for a home game lets you know what they think about your home field advantage. They disrespecting you. Yeah, you're 4-12, and 12, but they send good teams over there all the time. The Patriots go over there. The Steelers go over there all the time to play games in London. But they don't take away one of their home games. They take away Jacksonville's home games. They take away Oakland's home games. They take away Tampa Bay's home games. They don't take away the Falcons' home games. But they did this year because they don't respect you. Nobody respects you. Your division don't respect you. The rest of this conference don't respect And now the league don't even respect you enough to let you play eight home games. They want to take one of your home games and throw them over there to London. That's disrespectful. So now it's time for you to stand up and show them how you do it in the A. So now we go to independent variable. Toughness and turnovers. I talked about toughness a lot. Everybody's talking about toughness with this football team. Your own head coach and general manager are talking about toughness. Your owner is talking about toughness for a reason. Get tough. I talked about getting tough already. I'm not harping on it anymore. You need to be tougher in the trenches on both the offensive and defensive sides of the football. End of discussion. Turnovers. You got to get more turnovers. Last year, you were negative seven in the turnover differential. That's not an a, a egregious number. There were teams much worse than that. But negative seven is not good enough for a team that has playoff aspirations. That needs to be a plus number. Even if it's only plus one, it needs to be in the pluses, never the negative. You'll rarely see a team in the negative make it to the postseason. It can happen. 
but it's rare. If you're losing a turnover battle, you're losing football games. You have to get turnovers. And that leads us to our dependent variable wins. Your wins will depend on your toughness and your turnovers because I'm going on a limb here. And it's a pretty thick branch. I'm not really going out on a limb that's going to break on me. This is a pretty safe and, and, and sure bet this offense is going to perform. So I didn't even add them into the mix in the, in the variables at all. Because I expect them, if, if there was a control in this thing, that would be it. It would be the, the offense. Because I know they're going to get it done. If they stay healthy, who's stopping them? Who's stopping this offense? I don't see anybody stopping. And I'm, I'm going to tell you something. I, I was questioning the Falcons for not going out and getting a tight end. Did you see Levine toy Lolo? Let me find out. Lolo want to go out and cut some weight. That man is in shape. Lolo was balling in preseason game number one. He got me excited because I saw a big lumbering bum last year. And Lolo went and cut weight. He looks athletic. Let me find out Lolo trying to be the new TG. I don't know if he's going to pick up where Tony left off. That's some big shoes to fill. But Lolo looks good, and you can't teach the one thing that he has. That's that height. So, tell me another team in the league, and you'll be hard-pressed to find one. Tell me another team in the league that over the last two years, three players in one of the last two years had over 1,000 yards. You find any other teams, you let me know. But the Falcons have that. So, I expect this offense to do big things because they got three receivers that can get you. And if Levine Toy Lolo is out there balling, they got four options that can really beat you anyway. You want, it, you want it. They can give it to you any way you want it. So the toughness and the turnovers are going to be key because I don't think this defense is going to be all that great. So the only way to combat that, the great, and I call this the great equalizer. Haven't said that in a while, but the great equalizer is turnovers. You want to even and, and level out the playing field when your defense isn't that good? The only way to do it. Ask the New Orleans Saints when they won the Super Bowl. Their defense was terrible. But they got turnovers, though. That's the great equalizer. You want to equal it out? Get turnovers. Those two things, in conjunction with the offense, which you know is going to do their thing, it's going to get you wins. And that's your dependent variable. So you go on to the constant. Roddy, Roddy, White. My man. Hot Rod. I'm going to tell you what. People sleep on Roddy White. I remember back to when this man first came in the league in 2005, and I said, who is this kid out of UAB? Why did they draft him in the first round? What are they doing? And the first two years were disappointing. And everybody thought, this kid is going to be a bust. And I said, hey, I don't know. I don't know if he's going to be a bust. Maybe he won't live up to the first round hype. But I don't know if he's going to be a bust. And then what he embarked on the next six years, Hall of Fame worthy. I think people don't give Roddy White the credit that he deserves. I really don't. I don't really think people know how good he is. So let me tell you, because I did this last year, but I don't think anybody was watching. So I'm going to do it again because I know people are watching now. Roddy White is one of seven receivers in NFL history. Listen to what I'm saying. History. Okay? This is ever. With 80, 11, and 6 in five consecutive years. And he did it. To be technical, six straight years. Last year was the first year he hasn't done it in six years. Seven. So, five straight years and six if you want to be technical. Six straight years. But for this purpose, five straight years of 80, 11, and six. Only seven receivers in the history of the NFL have ever done that five consecutive years. 80 catches, over 80 grabs, over 1,100 yards receiving, and six touchdowns. Seven receivers in history. You get what I'm saying? Do you, do you hear how elite that is? Only seven. Roddy White doesn't get the credit that he deserves. One of the best receivers, one of the most technical receivers, some of the best hands, he has, the, he has a game that will age like fine wine. It will just get better with time. 
He will play for another six, seven years. Because when the speed leaves, he'll still be able to be savvy, get open, create separation, and catch the football. He still will be able to find the holes in zone defense. He'll still be able to do all of the little things that makes guys Hall of Fame receivers. Roddy White is the constant on this football team. Conclusion for the Atlanta Falcons. What does this all mean for the Atlanta Falcons? I really like this football team. And a lot of people, they want to talk about Tony Gonzalez not being back. And they want to talk about this, that, and the other. This is a good football team. And if you think them getting healthy isn't going to make a big difference, you're fooling your damn self. Okay? Find me an offense that's better. And, yeah, they need to run the football better. Steven Jackson needs to run the football better. They, they drafted Devonta Freeman. He needs to stay healthy. He's already banged up. They need to run the football better. Jack Williams, Rodgers, Anton Smith looks really good. They need to run the football better. Whatever you got to do, they just need to be better offensively running the football. But their passing attack is elite. <laughs> you won't find many others better in the league when Julio and Roddy – Julio and Roddy Roddy White, the hot rod, when them cats is healthy, sprinkle in a little Harry Douglas. And even though he wears women's deodorant, he asks me nicely, so I won't judge him. I won't judge him. But the man can go out and play some football. You show me three receivers that's doing what those boys are doing out there in the A. And tell me that Julio Jones being healthy, tell me that Roddy White being healthy doesn't make a difference. You a goddamn lie. You sit there, look me in my eyes and tell me that it doesn't make a difference. You can't. Because you can't do it. Because it makes a huge difference. These boys are going to score points. And they're going to put pressure on other teams to have to keep up. Now, is the defense going to do their part? I can't answer that. I really can't. Your schedule is tough. Your division is tough. I'm asking a lot out of you. And I don't know if you're going to be able to answer the bell enough to get back to the postseason or not. Because right now I got you at 9-7. and seven. Now, 9-7 and seven isn't going to be good enough to get you a playoff spot. It's not in the NFC. In the AFC, maybe that could fly. In the NFC, that's not going to be good enough. There's too many good teams in the NFC. 10 is a must to get in. We saw the Arizona Cardinals last year win 10 and not even get in. So you could easily win 10 or 11, though. There's a couple of winnable games I got you losing on your schedule the ball bounce your way. If you're able to stay healthy, I could easily see you going 11 and 5. But right now, I'm going to play it safe. It's 9 and 7. 4 and 2 in the division. 9 and 7 overall. And I could easily see you getting to 11 and getting into the postseason. Would not surprise me one bit. You're not winning this division, though. But I could easily see you sneaking in the back door of the postseason. And nobody wants to play you. Even though you struggled on the road in the postseason, nobody wants to play the Falcons. Because they can score points. And so, that's going to do it for the Atlanta Falcons and their lab reports. I thank you for joining me. If it happens in the National Football League, whether big or small, we cover it all here in the lab room. I thank you for joining me. Come back and join me tomorrow when we'll be talking about the Arizona Cardinals. We going out to the land of the sun to have some fun. See you tomorrow. Have a good one. Like the content? Want more? Sub up.